So uh, good afternoon to everybody and thanks to Aaron for inviting me to give a talk here and to Yossi and Gadi for leading this uh, a quantum center. Um, I will try to talk a little bit about what is happening in my group and a little bit more. I only have 20 minutes, so it's not nothing can be much more about what is happening in the world. Um, so I presume that many of you heard that uh, Google claimed to achieve quantum supremacy and soon after IBM claimed it is not correct. And I'm sure that uh, whether it is correct or not, uh, we will hear more and more about quantum supremacy in the coming year or two or five. <coughs> um, and this uh, quantum supremacy issue is not about a problem that is of interest to the high tech or to the real world. It is a of a huge interest to the theoretical world, academic world. Uh, it could be the moment somebody will prove quantum supremacy on a real device, on an, on an active device, it might be a Nobel Prize, <coughs> I don't know. Um, and I will explain a little bit about this. I will also talk about universal versus a sub-universal quantum computer in the connection of quantum simulations. Um, and also a little bit about quantum cryptography. So, Um, this is uh, just an example that quantum computers are still in a stage equivalent to standard computers about, I don't know, 40, 50, 70 years ago when people didn't know yet whether transistors or uh, radio tubes or maybe various other things like if you saw the Enigma in some movies uh, it was not clear yet what will be the computer in 10 years. And we are exactly in this situation. So for example, while IBM and Google and I think also Intel are working in one direction, there is another company, Rigetti, also uh, allowing, uh, uh, like IBM, I think they also allow uh, the public to use their computers uh, which is a very similar one to the one of IBM. Um, <coughs> on a totally different direction in China, uh, Pan, who was a postdoc of uh, Anton Zeilinger and uh, is now maybe the best experimentalist in photonics, uh, quantum information, and he ran uh, a, a sub-universal photonic quantum computer with only five photons, but I think there were <laughs> 10 different possible passes, so it is more than just five qubits. Um, and there are many, many other directions. One direction which is extremely popular is ion trap, and another one is uh, uh, atoms in, in a cavity, uh, for which uh, Harosh and Wineland got, uh, well, Harosh got the Nobel Prize for this, and, uh, uh, and Wineland is more for the ion trap. Um, so I will talk about, well, most of you know what we need it for, but I will try to make it more precise. I'm sure that there are some things that you will learn about why, why do we need these things. And then there are quantum bits and algorithms. I will not talk about implementations. You heard this and you will hear it in uh, many other talks. Uh, and the race to 50, I will actually start with this. So what is exactly this race to quantum supremacy? <coughs> Maybe it can be reached already with 50 qubits. Maybe we need 70 or 100. I don't know. Uh, it depends because there are these qubits are not very clean, are not sufficiently clean. So dealing with errors is a huge part of whether they can prove supremacy or not. I will skip some slides. Um, I have this actually. I want to go here. So suppose we have a quantum computer first, and suppose it is working with n qubits. So in one step, we get a superposition of 2 to the power n states. So 
So if you have a quantum computer of just 50 qubits in just one step, which maybe you know the Hadamard gate, I will, I might have time at the, uh, before the end of this talk to describe a little bit what the Hadamard gate is. In one step in which we apply Hadamard gate to each of the qubits, we get a superposition of 2 to the power n. If it is 50, it will be 2 to the power 50 different states. And then in parallel, we can run the algorithm on all these states. So of course, classical computers cannot do this. But this is not yet good enough. We also need interference. Uh, because only after the interference, we can get the good solution to come with a higher probability. Otherwise, it will just be exponentially small probability because there are two to the 50 possible passes, and only a few of them provide the good solution. So we need to have some type of interference. And Peter Shaw was clever enough to find the right interference that will solve a problem, which is how to factorize large numbers, which is still the most important thing that a quantum computer can do. If somebody has a quantum computer today that can factorize large numbers, everything we do with the internet is insecure. Everything. Oh, also with this guy says a classical computer that can do that. Right. Now, we don't know if factoring is difficult, so potentially also somebody with his laptop can do it. And this is the difference between what we call computational security, which relies on the difficult of some mathematical problem, versus informational security, which does not depend on computational power. But now I go back to this. So what is the supremacy problem? So first of all, I need to explain about some complexity classes. So the class P is everything that this computer can solve. OK, this is called the class P. And when I say solve, I mean solve in polynomial time. Because if something takes exponential time and we will use an input of 1,000 bits, then it can never solve it. So and we don't, in computer science, we don't really care whether it is a, when it is polynomial, whether it is n or n to the 3 or n to the 12. And when it is an exponent, it is just an exponent. But I will soon show that it does influence when, in practice, we can solve something. But in theory, we just care about exponential separation. So if a problem is here and not here, I can use this. If a problem is in NP but not in P, it means that this computer will need exponential power. And everybody believes that factoring large numbers is in NP and not in P. Now, we can add more classes here. But before this, I want to explain what is NP. So NP is everything that this computer can solve if you give it a hint. For example, why factoring is in NP? Because the hint could simply be the factor. So the person that gives the hint could have infinite power. So if somebody with infinite power gives us a hint, it doesn't need to be the solution. It could be any other hint. But with the hint, we can solve it. Then it is in NP. So if somebody gives us the factor, we just multiply or we divide. And we know that it is true, so we can check it. So if a problem can be verified on this computer, then it is in NP. Now, um, BPP, I will not get into it because time is very limited. But BPP is actually everything that we can really solve in practice. It's a bit more than what this can do. Because in practice, you can also use coins. And you get random numbers. And you use them. And it might give more power. There is no proof of this, but it might give more power. And this is BPP. Now, a quantum computer can do everything that is in P. Also, it can simulate a coin just by asking if it is 0 or 1 when you have some state. So quantum computer is stronger than BPP. Um, and actually, factoring, of course, is not in BPP, because otherwise it wouldn't be interesting, because BPPs can be solved. Quantum computers can solve problems that are incompatible with NP. That means 
NP is not included in BQ in what quantum computer can do, but also not the opposite case. So BQP, what quantum computer can do, will be a class that looks like this. It has some parts together with NP, but each one of them has <coughs> problems that cannot be solved by the other uh, type of class. Um, now this is important because it means that some problems in BQP if they are not in NP, BQP is what a quantum computer can solve. I will need to remember to mention it because you're not uh, familiar with the term BQP. So what some problems that a quantum computer can solve are not in NP. This means that even if I give you the solution, you cannot verify it with this computer. So not only that you cannot solve it, but you even cannot verify that the solution is correct, and it makes it more problematic in some cases because you cannot even verify that the quantum computer is telling you the truth. Or if you ask IBM to solve it for you, you don't know if they give you the correct solution if it is not in NP. Now, one problem, and it, we don't draw it in the same type of class, it is called sampling. And sampling is a different, uh, different circles of classes, and can you generate a probability distribution by a quantum computer that a classical computer, including flipping coins, will not be able to generate uh, the same distribution. So this is the problem that is now proven theoretically under some uh, assumptions to be solved by a quantum computer because the quantum computer simply generates the probability distribution and a classical computer cannot generate the same probability distribution. This is the problem used for proving supremacy. Now, how do we know that a classical computer cannot solve it? So I need to go beyond NP in order to understand why we believe that the quantum computer a, that a classical computer cannot solve it, even when we add coins. Well, it's important to comment you're stronger than BPP and P only under some assumptions, which are the assumptions are uh, weaker than P equals NP. Right. Everything in complexity classes, almost everything we discuss is under assumptions because in computer science we cannot prove that P is different from NP. And even if we assume that P is not equal NP, still there are many things we cannot prove. So a lot of what I'm saying is under some assumption. Now, suppose you have a machine that is much stronger than P and it can solve NP. And it is also in some sense, in some sense, stronger than a quantum computer because I told you that some problems in NP especially a problems that are named NP complete, cannot, probably cannot be solved on a quantum computer. But suppose we have a machine, it is called non-deterministic machine. Suppose we have a machine that can solve exactly all the problems in NP. How can we make this machine even stronger in the same way that we made this machine stronger by giving a hint? So giving a hint and then checking on this computer moved the type of problems we can solve from P to NP. Now, if we have an NP solving machine and we give somebody with infinite power gives a hint, we can solve even a larger class. I think it is called Sigma 2. And then it is a different machine that is, a, that is around NP containing NP. Now, suppose you have another machine that is solving everything in sigma 2, but if you give it a hint by somebody with infinite power, you can solve even more difficult problems. So we have sigma 3, and then we have sigma 4, and actually we have an infinite hierarchy of problems, uh, of classes, that each one containing more problems. Now, for the same reason that computer scientists believe that P is smaller than NP, so there are problems in NP that are not in P, the same logic tells us 
that also the next class is larger than NP, so sigma 2 is larger than NP and sigma 3 is larger than sigma 2, etc., etc. Now, there is a proof, extremely complicated one, you can spend more than one semester just to teach that proof, that if a classical computer with flipping coins can simulate the probability distribution of a quantum computer, then this polynomial hierarchy, that's the name that they give to, to, N, to P, NP, sigma 2, sigma 3, etc., this polynomial hierarchy collapses and everything in this is just in sigma 3. And computer scientists don't see any reason for that collapse and that is part of the proof. There are some more assumptions, but this is the main assumption for, this, for considering quantum supremacy. So supremacy is proven under the assumption that polynomial hierarchy does not collapse to sigma 3. So I hope it is clear because I would like to continue to the next topic. Uh, how much time do I still have? Yeah, so if people want to ask, so later, please. Um, now, I will not get to the qubit, but I do want to get to, uh, to factoring and what it means to the internet. So computer, quantum computers can factorize large numbers. They can also solve another problem called uh, the discrete log problem. But there are similar problems that we don't know if quantum computers can solve or not. And one of them is called the shortest lattice <coughs> on uh, the shortest vector on a lattice. And why do I mention these uh, problems? Because the entire cryptography today more or less relies on the fact that factoring is difficult. So if a quantum computer exists, maybe in China, maybe in, in I don't know, NASA, the US, <coughs> somebody has a quantum computer, a large one, then we are in a, in a big problem. They can just take all the money from the banks. They can know almost everything that we are doing, every password, everything. So why do we believe that the quantum computer, maybe it has supremacy proven, but it cannot solve a uh, factoring? Now, it, uh, factoring is the basic for a protocol called RSA, Rivest Shamir Adelman. Shamir is a computer scientist at Weizmann. RSA is the protocol on which most of the internet is based, including Wi-Fi, etc. Um, and the reason that it is not practical yet is because the advantage is not n versus 2 to the n. If it was n versus 2 to the n, okay, take 1, n equal 100, and you're done. Yeah, a quantum computer can solve it, a classical computer cannot. Maybe you're not done today, but in two years or five years, you're done. But the advantage must, it is much smaller. As far as I know, the best classical algorithm is exponential in n, but not exactly in n, but in the third root of n. So it means that instead of taking n equal 100, we need to take n equal million in order to see the advantage. But also the, the quantum computer doesn't need n steps, but something like n square. So it will need million square steps. And we are not there yet. The qubits are not clean enough. And we need what is called fault tolerant error correction, etc. So we are very far. Nobody can predict if we will have quantum computers that can factorize large numbers in 10 years or in 20 years or in 30 years. But even if we believe it will only happen in 20 years, we already need to care about it now because we try to build smart cities, we try to build uh, autonomous vehicles, and these things, if you build them today, it takes you 10 years to build them, and then maybe the quantum computer will already crack them. So you need a, a new type of cryptography. And here I want to remind you that I mentioned that there are other problems that quantum computers can solve, like discrete log, but also problems that we don't know if it can solve, like the shortest vector on a lattice. So today there is a whole field called post-quantum cryptography, which is still regular cryptography. It is still based on computing power, on problems that are hopefully computationally secure, 
but different problems not factoring. For example, shortest vector on a lattice, learning with errors, some, some other problem, and the entire cryptography can be moved to these problems. But who knows how much time it will take to move, <coughs> to transfer the entire internet to new type of problems, and they don't give good solutions. The solutions are much, much slower. Imagine that your entire internet becomes slower by three orders of magnitude, because this is more or less what will happen if we try to move now from cryptography to post-quantum cryptography. Another alternative is quantum cryptography. Uh, quantum cryptography is not computationally secure. It is supposed to be information secure. It is based on the no cloning principle. A quantum state, even of a single qubit, cannot be uh, replicated, cannot be uh, multiplied. And quantum cryptography is another topic that I work in my team. And the last thing I will say, that in addition to problems like factoring that might take 20 years, and quantum supremacy that is not having <coughs> any practical usages, the third type of problem is having an extremely important practical usages. People believe that a quantum computer can solve exponentially faster problems in quantum chemistry. For example, some other types, problems in many electronic systems, phase transitions, there is no proof. <coughs> but the competition of this type between classical and quantum computers will probably, or is already starting, or maybe will start in two years or in four years, but it is there. 100 qubits for sure will start such a competition. Thank you. Okay.